time for discussion um, at the later part of today's session. Um, this uh, title, slide and picture, for those uh, who don't know, um, re we recently had uh, an edited collection published through Pavilion Press um, called the Neurodiversity Reader. And um, this has 27 different chapters in it, ranging from theory to practice, and um, highly recommended, of course. I would say that being the lead editor on the volume. <laughs> but uh, I'll, this is an example in itself of the work of Park over the last few years and where we've got to in that time. My computer's going a bit slow. Um, so for those who don't know me, um, I'm autistic myself, um, as is my son, who was diagnosed a few years before I was. My son's now 18 years old and uh, would be classed as having severe learning disability as well. My background's in social science primarily. I started out in sociology and expanded out into psychology, philosophy, education, and so on. So I spent most of my adult life in and out of universities. I'm currently a part-time lecturer at the Physical Centre, University of Kent. I also do some work with uh, Southbank University I'm the chair of PARC and also a direct, one of the directors on what's called the National Autistic Task Force. And this is um, an organisation that seeks to influence policy and practice, so it has a more pragmatic edge to it than PARC does as an uh, organisation. So, I'm going to start with my sociological background um, because within social science, there's been debates around insider and outsider perspectives and their relative advantages and disadvantages, which go right back to the origins of many of these disciplines. So in psychology, um, introception and thinking about one's own experiences went out of fashion quite early on. So it was quite popular in the late 19th century with William James, but less so in the early part of the 20th century. Um, and it was seen you needed kind of a more objective scientific approach in many respects. In sociology, um, an early article was written by a guy called Robert K. Merton about these issues. And he had a kind of more balanced idea in sociology of advantages and disadvantages from both insider and outsider perspectives being applied. And you can see this in a lot of uh, social scientific work, which is more qualitative in the methods used, sort of asking people about their experiences, this kind of stuff, in what's called positionality. And a lot of articles and reports will have a positionality statement. And this is kind of laying oneself open somewhat because there's inherent biases from one's particular perspectives, but instead of trying to hide that away as if it didn't exist, being open about it. There's also the um, various feminist theories. One of a concept which I quite like myself is one called situated knowledge. And this is about um, valuing the knowledge of 
ex experiential knowledge of a particular situated existence in society. So the lived experience of women, as it was initially argued, rather than some objective kind of gaze. And these all relate, in my mind at least, to concepts around neurodiversity and how that has been influenced heavily in many areas by things like the social model of disability. Not all neurodiversity writers and activists and scholars do follow that, but many do, probably most. And my own work, which goes back to the 1990s, before I knew anything about autism as a formal concept, um, I use the word disposition, not to mean um, a set static disposition you're born with, but more the way you're disposed in life and how this is influenced by both biological and social factors uh, intertwining all the time, as it were. Um, and in the 90s, I talked about the human spectrum of dispositional diversity was a bit of a mouthful, but uh, was, I still think is a, a good concept in a sense, what I was trying to get at. Um, this photo here is an example of the potential power of the stories and lived experience and how they're situated in time as well. Um, this is me and my brother in our best Starsky and Hutch pose <laughs> in the late 70s. And uh, you may notice it's me on the left there, that I have a red jumper on, which my, my mother knitted for me and had my name, Damien, uh, knitted across it. This is in case I got lost and people asked me my name because I'd probably freeze out of anxiety and stress and not be able to speak. So just looking at old photographs, and this was 30 years before I was formally diagnosed, um, gives a story of an autistic life through time, but situated in a social setting where Autism at the time was recognised quite differently. So had my son been born at that time, uh, he would have been diagnosed as autistic, um, most likely. Um, but I wasn't at that time, but was later on. So these changes are very much socially situated and insider accounts are very much of value. And when listening to lived experiences, um, sometimes you get a, a different set of aims and objectives um, by participants themselves. And ethical controversies over what research should be for. And in the case of autism research, there's all the uh, contested debates around whether someone should be researching with a goal of normativity or of acceptance and celebration of diversity so as a goal are we looking at behavioral outcomes and so-called social skills or understanding and personal autonomy um, this uh, communication page i use often with this which was uh, created by the late mel bag by themselves to communicate with a support worker which was, who was particularly stressing them out. But it shows when someone's creating a tool for themselves to use, um, that it looks potentially quite different to when a communication page is designed for someone and so on. And there's many other things one can use this example for. Um, and I'm not against positive randomized controlled trials, not at all. They have certainly have their place. And if you're 
testing out whether something does what the people say it does and you want to test that out scientifically as best as possible and it's about the best thing we've got which is why it's seen as the gold standard method in health research and so but there's also building collaborative communities of practice how you translate research to on the ground work which is meaningful for people so what you put in the rct to begin with needs to make sense um, be grounded um, and much research which a lot of money is spent on has some pretty dodgy theoretical foundations to put it politely um, in a paper i wrote back in 2014 um, around what I called autistic expertise. I was looking at issues around the double empathy problem, but also participation in research and setting the research agenda. And I asked the question, how much interactional expertise is possible between autistic and non-autistic people? And this phrase, interactional expertise, is expertise in culture and un cultural understanding so it's not being a contributory expert but it's being enough of an expert to interact and talk the talk of a particular culture and be accepted in that kind of culture in uh, dialogue as it were it was originally used by sociologists studying quantum physicists and the work they did. And the sociologists said they needed a, a level of understanding of quantum physicists and the work they did, not to the extent that they became a quantum physicist themselves, but enough understanding to do the study. And the sociologists suggested uh, that should be a kind of minimum standard for work with cultural groups. But gaining expertise in what it is to be autistic would take immersion in the culture and practices of autistic people. And it's questionable as to what extent such immersion is possible for non-autistic people. And certainly doubtful that many established researchers have made such an effort. Although some have to their credit, I would say. So good on you for the good ones out there. Um, and the need for insider knowledge in the autism world was being stated a long time ago. Is a favourite quote of mine from the late Donna Williams. Right from the start, from the time someone came up with the word autism, the condition has been judged from the outside by its appearances and not from the inside according to how it is experienced. And this is where participatory research for me comes in. Um, participatory research for me is uh, can relate to a range of theoretical and methodological approaches. Uh, some people out there have quite a rigid structure of how it should look and how to do community input and things like this. But to me, it's much more of an ethos an ideology, something to build towards, aim towards, and constantly be trying to improve. With the main objective of uh, seeding power from the researcher to research participants, whether it's community members or community-based organisations. And in this research, participation, sorry, participants take control more of the research agenda process and actions taken. And most importantly, in terms of analyzing and reflecting on the information and data generated in interpreting the findings and uh, coming up with the conclusions of the research. And <clears throat> this is why PARC was set up. Um, to bring autistic people and 
including scholars and activists, together with early career researchers and practitioners who work with autistic people, to uh, further a participatory agenda. And this was influenced by previous autistic-led projects. There was um, one project which was called the Theorizing Autism Project, which held a couple of seminars um, in 2012 and 2014, I think it was, which I was part of this group doing this project. Um, and with quite similar aims. So Park somewhat evolved out of this project, which was a grassroots autistic led one. And another thing which came out at that time was the autonomy journal uh, edited by Larry Arnold. And that's had a number of editions that have been put out online, free and open access, and mainly autistic writers in that series. Um, the park held its first meeting back in April 2015 at London South Bank University, and basically was five people in a room. Um, and that's where it started. Our aim was to build a community network where those who wish to see a more significant involvement of autistic people in autism research could share their knowledge and expertise. And this was a group or network, not just for researchers. So that community participatory thing was there from the outset. And these five of us laid down these objectives to address the isolation felt by many autistic researchers, ensure that research carried out by autistic people could be found and used to raise the reputation of participatory research methods in the field and to critically comment on autism research which did not empower autistic people. And I would say we've done actually quite well on the, these objectives. I'll show you some evidence for that later. In order to achieve these objectives, we suggested that Park would encourage autistic people starting out in research, provide peer feedback on research and support for accessing funding, and holding meetings and events, which we've certainly done a lot of. Um, the one area there in these two slides that we've somewhat struggled with, I would say, is funding. And that's something I'll return to as well. So the website for Park was set up a bit later in 2017, um, but it continues to attract good interest when blogs and events and so on are posted up. And we've also included some critical blog posts regarding research and practice in the field. Um, there was one rather good one critique uh, by Jill Loons of uh, some research a while back, which was linking autism with terrorism in rather clunky ways. Um, and so he did a critical post about that. We've held events, uh, in-person events in London, Birmingham, Sheffield, Nottingham, Glasgow and Kent a wide range of contributors and starting to build international connections. And so hello to my international friends today who said they could join. Um, and uh, examples of that is some um, uh, crossover with the work of uh, Stephen Shaw in America. Um, and that's included uh, Stephen doing talks for the park events in the past, uh, myself doing talks for students of Stephen's that have been brought over to London for summer schools and things like that. Um, so a bit of crossover there. And I think now doing online events is this one is another way of building those international connections. So maybe that's one of the next steps to 
FARC and other such groups, is building those networks further. <clears throat> We've done a lot of conference activity, um, not just holding workshops and smaller events, but chairing streams at practice conferences like Learning Disability Today, uh, academic streams such as at uh, the uh, Lancaster University Disability Studies Conference. We held a Park Fringe event at the Scottish Alton 50th anniversary, anniversary Conference in 2018. Um, we've also run our own Critical Autism Studies Conference at London South Bank University each year. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't run one this year because of COVID, but as soon as we're able to, we'll be back doing such events. Um, we've also had publications, uh, a number of Projects related to PARC have had their own articles and related publications. We've also had two special edition editorials of advances in autism around education. Um, and we've also had something of a partnership with Pavilion Press, who do a lot of practice related materials. And uh, there's my own work. Um, is often published through them, but also other PARC members and conveners. So I've got uh, Dr. Susie Ridout had a couple of books uh, published through them as well, and the Neurodiversity Reader, which showed at the start. Um, so key issues for me uh, moving forward, the way I see it. Um, Funding, 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 um, and investment in participatory research. Park itself is an unfunded, loose network um, and an open one, um, but it often needs to partner more funded projects or conferences in order to uh, work with. Um, but finding uh, funding for participatory research is still not easy. Um, going back a few years, the Future Made Together report by Liz Pelicano and colleagues uh, in its recommendations prioritised participatory research. This led to the Shaping Autism Research UK seminar series, which I was uh, part of the research team for and toolkits for participatory research, which I'd very much recommend that website and that toolkit. Um, but all of this work and effort has certainly had an impact on the field. Um, and there's more connections um, and more focus on participation than there ever has been in the past. However, it's still a uh, small fry funding wise in comparison to medical research and neuroscientific research and so on. If you look up at the makeup of the INSAR conference each year, social research is rather slim on that list. Um, perhaps in other conferences, we've been making bigger inroads things like Autism Europe Congress. Uh, um, not perfect, but there's certainly greater input around these areas than before and so on, and certainly in more national conference level. Um, there's the issue of intersectionality and um, multiple oppressions that people can experience in their social life. Um, and I think this is an ongoing issue in the autism field, but it's something uh, we can help to do something about. Um, Park over the years has had a partnership with Autism Voice UK, which tries to spread awareness about autism in largely African communities, both in the UK and in Africa. Um, and 
it's initiatives like this which is very much needed community groups coming together and working together um but we need more of that basically um and there's growing uh, work around things like lgbtq plus issues and so on uh there's the fourth gen sex uh, conference a couple of years back um led by some part members up in Birmingham. um but this area i think still needs a lot of focus and effort another ongoing area as ever is the crossover with autism and learning disability or intellectual disability um, and participation and voice and what that means for people who may not uh, use spoken language um, or less often or other communication methods and so on or like my son um, could not give formal consent to research um, would not be able to communicate these things so easily how would you include them in research ethically? And these are bigger than path as issues, but what can we do as a group to further these areas as well? Um, but despite issues such as funding and so on, there's a great deal of opportunities as I see it. Um, the power of both individual and collective endeavours. So having the collective of say park and such uh, networks and organizations and linking up individual efforts because i know many of us like to plow our thing in our own way but it's good to be supported in that and have understanding people to bounce ideas off of and so on so between both it can empower people um Another plus, which comes from both individual and collective efforts, is interdisciplinarity in the field. But one of the problems is you get psychologists going off doing their thing, sociologists doing their thing, designers and artists doing their thing. And it's bringing that all together. And these efforts are often uh, being most supported and driven by the autistic community themselves that I find particularly interesting. The autistic scholars like myself often go across disciplines and they're very pro interdisciplinarity because it helps translation to practice, which is my next point. Um, and another thing we can do is build better links with practice and communities than a lot of researchers usually do. Um, so actually translating this research into practical use for people, um, links like the National Autistic Task Force can also link with policy developments, uh, put pressure on NHS government departments and so on. And all of this is built stronger by building these networks and links like PARP does through collaborative communities of practice. So we may not always agree with each other in these spaces, but uh, we can that support and that debate furthers all of us, um, if done respectfully and so on. So, um, which, brings me to the discussion points to come out of all of this um, for today and opening it out to all of you. Um, I'm not sure we should leave these up though. I'll copy them into the uh, chat, which would probably be better. I can do that in a minute. But my discussion points that I wanted to pick up so we can concentrate on these or other points you might want to bring up too. How can we as a research community build small steps toward participation 
yet at the same time avoid tokenistic gestures? How do we help each other with the emotional labor of being an autistic researcher researching autism? Um, I am pretty aware not everyone here will be autistic, but you might want to take this question of how can we support our colleagues who are autistic with this? How can we access funding and work with allies to access funding? Because something non-autistic researchers seem to be sometimes quite good at is acquiring funding. So how do we build on work with allies in this respect? And what are the potential benefits of being something of an outsider researcher? And I mean this both within the academy and outside of it. So we don't quite fit the mould, um, but in some ways that can be a good thing too. So these are the questions I thought might be interesting, but please do add points and questions as well. There's a bunch of references, and I'll share the slides uh, in some way or other afterwards. But there you go. Uh, 